Hi and welcome to the long road home. Unless I go long, this should be the last in the series on Psalm 1. We'll begin a new chapter of the Bible tomorrow, be it Psalm 2 or something else. Something else to edify us on our long road. So far we've gone over evidences of salvation in verse 1 as well as prescriptions for those who are saved to know what they ought to and ought not to do to strengthen or weaken their joy in God. We talked about delighting in the law of the Lord. We talked about Bible study and reading habits in verse 2. We talked about about the prosperity, the eternal prosperity, the stalwart joy, unshakability of the saint in verse 3. In verse 4, we juxtapose that against the non-Christian, like chaff, they, they, they fly off into the breeze of eternity. They do not stand firm. And then in verse 5, we said because they are like chaff, they will not be able to stand in the judgment, and in fact, they will be removed from the assembly of the righteous. And now we found the find the we find the foundation of all of it. Because well let's review the text. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that bears its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Everything he does prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For, when we see the word for, we are saying what was previously said is rooted, is founded, is on the foundation of what we're about to say. And I would argue that it's not just the foundation of verse 5, but the ver foundation of verses 1 through 5. Both the path that the, um, the righteous person does not walk and does walk, the results of walking that path, both in time, like a tree in time, and then eternally, judgment and assembly, the results of those paths are all founded on what we're about to read. Everything from birth to death of a wicked person, or from second birth to death into victory of the righteous person, everything founded on this following for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. That doesn't sound like all that much. It's just God, God is omniscient. He knows. He knows what the righteous person is going to do. And based on their righteousness, he rewards them, right? That's completely workspace. That is completely a false gospel if you take it under that interpretation. God knows the ways of the righteous. He knows that they're being righteous, and so he rewards them eternally. And he rewards them in time, and the wicked get punished eternally and punished in time. No. When we're talking about knowledge here, we're talking about an intimate personal knowledge. That is a, that's a euphemism for intimate personal relationships found throughout Scripture, not just here. So, so that's one. Knowing is intimate, it's personal, it's close. Like a man knows his wife and they bear a child, right? It, it's not specifically romantic, it's specifically intimate and close and personal. So God knows the way of the righteous. Well, why does God know the way of, his, of the righteous? Well, if you look further in Psalms, you'll find that David has said that God knew every single one of his days, no, I'm sorry, he wrote every single one of his days in his God's book before a single one of them came 
to be. I believe that's salt. I could have gotten them mistaken. He wrote them. He is the author. He is the author of the way of the righteous. And if he wrote uh, the righteous's way, did he write the wicked's way? Is he now the author of sin? No. The way of the wicked shall perish, juxtaposing against God knowing the way of the righteous. Of course, God is aware of the way of the wicked. That's why he punishes the wicked. But even though he is sovereign over their sin and can use their sin and is aware of their sin and nothing happens that he is not in control over, he did not author it. He authored the righteous's way and the wicked, the reprobate, the non-Christian were allowed to go their own way. And that is why they perish. Except for the restraining grace and common grace that God gives on everyone. Things like laws, um, love, and things like that to restrain evil. To restrain evil in natural, normal means. Not salvifically, not to change hearts, but to restrain evil. Other than that, God leaves us... The, I'm sorry, God leaves the non-Christian alone other than the, the call, the, the fire that both hardens some hearts and melts others unto salvation. That fire is applied to everyone, and, um, but it is not saving for everyone. But when God wants to harden a heart, when God wants to, and I'm borrowing from R.C. Sproul here, when God wants to harden a heart, let someone be, he lets them be reprobate. He doesn't make them. Uh, what is that? Uh, John 3, 17, for the Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved because the world stands condemned already. Because apart from him the world stands condemned already. Everyone already stands condemned. That's the path that we are born onto, is condemnation and judgment and wrath. We are, are children of wrath just like everyone else. But Christ in his love, God in his mercy, the Spirit in his grace. Um, and I'm not, I'm, not separate, I'm not getting into the weeds with that. I'm just saying the triune God working as one reaches into our hearts through the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the foreknowledge, the foreordination, the authorship of God the Father, and the working of the Holy Spirit through the gospel message, we are saved because he knows our path, because he wrote it. And apart from him intimately knowing our path, we stand condemned. It is all of Christ. It is all of God. It is all of the Holy Spirit. None of it is us. And yet, and yet, we are responsible, though not able through our sin nature, we are responsible to receive the gospel, to repent of our sins, and to look to Christ. All things that the natural man hates to do. The natural man wants it to be based on their righteousness. The natural man wants to earn salvation. The natural man wants to be their own God in that they are good enough for God to owe them something. But that is not the gospel. The gospel is grace, mercy, loving kindness that he does not owe anyone. And through his grace, love, mercy, and he and Hesed, his loving kindness, his covenant love. He saves the people for himself. He cuts a covenant with us because he loves us, and he loves us because of his covenant with us. It's it's a loop. It is it is God's foreknowledge. It is God's sovereign decree. It is God's hidden counsel. And everything in this psalm, just and everything in the Christian life, and everything in in the in the reprobate's life is founded on this truth. We are saved by him alone. Because he knows us before the foundation of the world. He knows us. And that is the only thing that separates us from the reprobate. There is nothing left to pride, nothing left to self. We fight for our sanctification. We fight for our personal holiness and our walk towards God. But it is not our power that does it. And it is not us that saves us. 
it is 100% all of Christ. The decision is not ours to be saved. The decision is God's. We are presented with the decision. We are offered the choice. We cannot make the choice on our own. It is all of God. And if God has moved on your heart today to repent and believe on His name, I ask you to turn from your sins, to hate your sins, and to lean on Christ. Because it is all of Him and He is your only hope for salvation. God bless you and good luck on your long road home.